Okay. Hello. So um, there's definitely was too much reading for today. This is this is the other case where I had to uh, like put two thing lectures together that I would usually do separately. Um, there's going to be too much for me to discuss too, but I'll do my best. Um, oh, but before I do that, I should discuss the second writing assignment because it's due next week. <laughs> um, let me just go over the instructions. Um, so uh, this, again, is just kind of an exercise, but it's a different exercise than the first paper was. <laughs> It's so th basically the idea is like to uh, try to understand exactly how Spinoza's definitions have been adjusted to make it possible to reach his conclusions. <laughs> um, so, um, so what it says is to start with one of the definitions or axioms, to start with one of the definitions or axioms. Think of something that's a little bit strange about it and then show that that thing is actually necessary for him to reach his main conclusion, one of his main conclusions. So you have a choice of Proposition 11 and Proposition 14 of, of Part 1, obviously. I don't know, it doesn't say that here, actually. It means of Part 1. <laughs> right? Proposition 11 of Part 1 is when he proves the existence of God and Proposition 14 is when he proves there is no other substance. So those are the main like conclusions that he's headed for in the first part of part one. Um, and the, the idea is to like see how he, you know, how he needed to adjust his definitions and axioms carefully to make sure he would get those conclusions. Yeah. So for ethics one, you know, just talking about just how everything comes from God, like that says in the play. And or how like God is like the only true substance. Yeah, so the first part up through proposition 15 is about how God is the only true substance and everything is in God. After the second part, which is part of the reading for today, is about how um everything comes from God. Uh, but I'll say more about that in a moment. Are there more questions about the writing assignment? Okay, let me ask a few questions about the writing assignment first. <laughs> yeah. For the Descartes assignment, we weren't allowed to mention technology to the student, but are we allowed to mention uh, modern physics and the mechanics? Because Spinoza like to talk about him using the modern physics framework. Right. I mean, so first of all, when I said like with the with the Descartes one, I didn't say you weren't allowed to use technology, but I said it was discouraged, right? Because and I tried to explain why. Uh, in this case, well, look, I mean, if one of these definitions. Now, the truth is the definitions and axioms at the beginning of part one are, are so general that it's, you know, but I, yeah, I guess maybe if you think uh, we know something different about causation now because of quantum mechanics or something, right? Like, I mean, uh, but like, he, he, you know, they don't even mention time. <laughs> so. So they're they're pretty far from physics. I mean, we talk. I'm going to talk about Spinoza's physics a little bit. I hope today. <laughs> That's the the reading from part two was about that. But so, but it, yeah. But if you did find some way that that this axiom or definition looks weird because of modern physics, it's probably not going to be. Since obviously, I mean, Spinoza doesn't know about modern physics. So he like he didn't deliberately make the axiom not con be consistent with modern physics. It's like that doesn't know about it, right? So I, I mean, he doesn't know about Newtonian physics. His physics is Cartesian physics. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, yeah, so I don't, I mean, I, again, I don't, wouldn't say you're not allowed to, but it doesn't seem likely to work out very well for this assignment. Um, um, some people, by the way, have thought that quantum mechanics in some ways shows that Spinoza is right. <laughs> Um, but uh, obviously you would have to adjust some of the details, but um, you know, that there's one wave function and it, there's an infinite number of observables and you know, something, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's somehow like uh, Spinoza's metaphysics would be the right way to think about it. Um, are there questions about the writing assignment before I get to the question about the reading? Yeah. Uh, is it just, uh, it says uh, at the beginning of that page, so it's, is it just part one that it's about? Yeah, one of the eight definitions or seven axioms at the beginning of the ethics, meaning at the beginning of part one. Yeah. As 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 we saw in the reading for today, at the beginning of part two, there's a bunch more definitions and axioms. And then, like, as you go on in part two, when he gets to the physics part, all of a sudden he introduces some other axioms. <laughs> um, so, like, there's axiom one and axiom two after the scolium to proposition 13 and then after the corollary to lemma three there's axiom one axiom two axiom three <laughs> so um yeah but no don't use any of those axioms because it doesn't use those to prove and again this means part one proposition 11 part one proposition 13. i should have made that clear in the assignment um okay are there other questions yeah so then so it's kind of like saying we critique one of the eight definitions of seven axioms and then we choose one of the propositions that are now completely affected by this um Rosen's refutation of one of the eight or seven definitions i mean Okay, I, like it says point out some way in which the axiom or definition is odd or surprising. That's not exactly the same as refuting it, <laughs> right? I mean, but yeah, you're supposed to, yeah, find something that seems odd or surprising about it and then show how that particular thing is necessary to get the conclusion. Yeah, so... So that would show that, I mean, it depends how you look at it. That would show that if you think you have to get rid of that thing that's odd and surprising, that would that would affect the proof. It wouldn't work anymore. Or on the other hand, you could say like, well, it's not that surprising when you realize he needs it for the proof. <laughs> it depends how you look at it. All right, anyway. Um, okay, you had a question about the reading. No, okay, no, it, I, I think you misread it if you thought that the body includes ideas. But bodies in, bodies are defined as finite modes of extension. Ideas are modes of thought, right? So there's this different, this is the way I sometimes draw it. Here's the divine essence and it's expressed in infinitely many ways. So here's one way it's expressed, and here's another way it's expressed. This one is thought, and this one is extension. And then each one of these attributes, actually, you know, I've always drawn it this way, but I feel like maybe it's a bad way to draw. 
Because then I say like, oh, an extension contains infinitely many finite modes. But this maybe isn't the right way to think about the relations between the, the attribute of extension and its finite modes. The finite modes follow from it. <laughs> They're like consequences of it. I don't know. Anyway, so the point is each one of these finite modes is a body. Uh, um, or each one is a simple body. I mean, with, I think I won't have time to talk if I would like to about what compound bodies are, um, which the human body is an example of. Well, you run into this too, but um, still, when, when referring to bodies as a concept versus to the human body, is that the same word? Yeah, yeah, and the, the word is corpus, yes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. I think I called attention to this in Descartes, right? Like when he, when he, when he talks about body, he means like all kinds of extended, well, of course in Spinoza, we're not going to say extended substances. There's only one extended substance, <laughs> but all kinds of extended things are, are going to be called bodies. So the air in this room is a body, whatever. The air in this room is a compound body, presumably. It's like, so, I mean, I, one thing I was going to say later, but I may as well say it right now. Uh, you know, Descartes and Leibniz are famously involved in the development of modern mathematics and physics. Right, like Cartesian coordinates and you know, right, et cetera. Spinoza, not really. Um, so as he himself says here, he's only he only goes into enough physics, and maybe this is what's leading to the confusion here. He he really, although he's talking about bodies in general, he's really only interested in the human body because he's only going up into enough physics to to allow him to say what he thinks about the human body and the relationship to the human mind. Um and oh, okay. Just the object is the idea of constituting the human mind as a body. Yeah, the, the object is a body. The object is a body. Right. The human mind is an idea. An object, which is a body, which is the human body. Yes, that is its human body, right? In other words, a particular human mind is an attribute is a is a finite mode of the attribute of thought. And it has an object, and its object is a body, a compound body that is a mode or a compound of modes. Again, so like, I think um, I'm not sure if Spinoza has a whole complicated way of thinking about this worked out, and he just doesn't get all the details out in here because they're not relevant, or if maybe he hasn't completely worked it out, <laughs> like in terms of exactly how to describe bodies in this like mode, whatever. Um, but I mean, he says some interesting things about it. But anyway, right, so this idea, this idea is also a compound, right? It's a compound idea. Contains many, it's made up of many ideas and its object is this body that's made up of many bodies. Um, and there's no pineal gland needed, needed to connect them. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Where do pineal glands go? Like the question would be like, so is there uh, like an idea of a hand irrespective of the idea that I have in my head of the hand itself? Like as a hand and extension, is there an idea uh, correlated to it in thought, which is purely that of the hand itself? Um. Yes, I mean, I think it's going to be better to talk about this after the reading for next time, where he talks about, like, in detail about, you know, so if if my mind is the idea of this body, does this, in what way does that give me an idea of the parts of that body? Um, and the answer is inadequately, <laughs> right? Um, but, um, uh, 
Yeah, so I mean, The only thing that's questionable, and this has to do again with the stuff that I've the complications that I would like to talk about, but that um, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> but that you know, I mean, how how exactly does the world get divided up into bodies for this purpose? Is there a particular right way, or is like? Any way of dividing up into bodies will will correspond to a way of dividing the attribute of thought up into ideas, and you no know, matter how you do it, it will work, right? And th on that depends the question of like, um, you know, so should I should should is it obvious that the hand there's an idea just of the hand, which would be the mind of the hand. Right, I mean, but every every idea of a body is 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 related to the body in the same way my mind is related to my body. So every body has a mind. Simple bodies have simple minds, and more complex bodies have more complex minds. <laughs> um, but again, does that mean that no matter how you divide it up, you're dividing it up into? things that have minds, or do you have to divide it up in a particular way? So, I mean, we'll see that in that in Leibniz, it's clear that you have to divide it up in a particular way, but in Spinoza, it's not so clear. Yeah. Okay, okay I might have been wrong, but I thought Spinoza was against the idea of splitting up infinite. Or, or, um... Yeah, I mean, that's why I said that this maybe is a bad way of drawing it. Like, yeah. It's... Yeah, that's an argument that he quotes and he says, like, he, it's not clear whether he endorses that argument, right? He actually says, I won't stop to say whether these are really absurdities or not. Right. So um, that that to me indicates actually that maybe he doesn't think that they're absurdities, right? You know, but um, um, but he does think that that um, well, look. So there's only one substance. It's not divisible. <laughs> I mean. That is, it's certainly not divisible into substances, but its attributes, again, every attribute, so like, again, I don't know what the right way to draw this would be, but every attribute expresses the whole essence. So like if the attribute were really divisible, then God would be divisible. So the attribute is not divisible, but it, it's simple, but it has infinitely many consequences. <laughs> and like over here in the attribute of thought, we're talking about, we'll see him say this more explicitly in the reading for next time. We're talking about somehow about logical consequences. Right, like so that is from the simple nature of thought, which is just one thing, right? It's involved in the idea of every thought, and therefore it's the cause of every thought. <laughs> right? Like the, the thoughts can't be conceived without it, but it can be conceived without them. <laughs> so um, so like um you know, this doesn't work out very well with the way we usually think about logic. And um, um, again, it's not clear to me how much how much Spinoza tried to work that out. But um, but I think Hegel, you know, is right to see Spinoza as kind of a forerunner of, of Hegel's logic. Right? This is the kind of this is what Hegel would call a concrete universal. You know, it's like a universal, but rather than being 
empty, like an universal that arises by abstraction. So it contains none of the, the things that are particular to the, to the individuals that fall under it. It somehow contain, is, is the power to generate all the community. Yeah. It says that uh, no absolute substance can be conceived from which it follows that the substance can be divided. So he doesn't necessarily say that the, the infinite mode of the attribute of thought, uh, which constitutes substance, uh, cannot be divided. Right. Yeah, but I think he does say that afterwards that it can't be that extension can't be divided. I know that he says an attribute extension. Yeah. But as a mode of extension, in particular. Yeah. Extension. So the modes of extension are divisible. Yeah. But what that means exactly, you know? Yeah. Well, the attributes of this, the divine substance are infinite, right? Not just thought and extension. Is, so, that, is that right? Well, so <laughs> I think I mentioned this before. <laughs> Maybe I just this should just be a question and answer session. I shouldn't try to give a lecture. <laughs> no, no, I mean serious. I, I wasn't. I didn't mean that as a joke. I meant seriously. Maybe that would be a better way to go. Um, so I think I mentioned this before, right? So he says that you know that that it, that God is an infinite substance with infinitely many attributes, each of which expresses the nature of eternal or whatever, right? Um, however, um, well, so first of all, he says, we only know about two attributes, right? I mean, we know about extension because our mind is, maybe that's the wrong order. We know about thought because our mind is a mode of thought. <laughs> And we know about extension because our mind has an object, which is a mode of extension. But we don't know about any other attributes. So, so far, it sounds like there's, you know, there's lots of other attributes. We just don't know what they are. And we'll never know what they are. It's like the shadow consciousness. Yeah, right. And like each one of these has finite modes. And but this is where it starts to get weird. So each one of these has finite modes, and these finite modes also must have minds. That is right because they, um, it's right like what Proposition Sixteen says is that everything that can be conceived by infinite intellect is produced by God. And everything that can be conceived by infinite intellect is conceived in um, the. So it's not the attribute of thought itself that the, the intellect is a mode of the is an infinite mode of the attribute of thought, right? And within that infinite intellect, there are there have to be ideas of everything that fall. So I mean, so that the problem roughly speaking, is that it starts to look like it's weird, like this attribute is really special. Yeah. Right? This at this one attribute of thought contains ideas of all the other attributes. So it's like bigger. And it becomes worse because in the scolium to part two, uh, part two proposition seven. So Part two, proposition seven is the famous, the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. Um, right, I mean, that's really like, that's gonna be super necessary for solving the mind-body problem. Mind-body problem is solved because even though the body doesn't cause anything in the mind or vice versa, the like, sequence by which bodies or the the acts that is motion and rest of bodies cause each other is the same as the logical sequence by which their ideas follow from each other so um so without any like causation back and forth there's a complete parallel that's what that's that's what um part two proposition seven says and um I mean, 
the official proof, which is really, really short, just refers back to part one axiom four. So part ac one axiom four is the knowledge of, of an effect depends on and involves the knowledge of the cause. Right, so in other words, if you have the existence or, or motion or rest of body mount A causing the existence or motion or rest of body B, so this is the cause and this is the effect. Um, so according to um, part one axiom four, the knowledge of the effect. So the knowledge of the effect is gonna involve at least the idea of the effect, right? So here's the idea of the effect. Whether you need something else to call it knowledge, let's leave that aside, right? So, that, so here's the idea of the effect and it can only be conceived through the idea of the cause. So wherever there's a cause and effect relationship here, and the, this is right, this is extension, and this is thought. Whenever there's a cause and effect relation here, there's like a logical relation here. That's what part one axiom four already says. So that's why the proof of this, the official proof, is just like one sentence. It's just like C part one axiom four. But then there's a scolium where he says, and you can see the same thing even more clearly by realizing that each of these attributes expresses the same divine essence. And therefore the modes of this attribute are really just the same as the modes of that attribute only expressed in a different way. And this causes the problem because now you're like, like, um, It seems like this one has to have a lot more modes than, <laughs> than, I mean, not more necessarily in the like mathematical sense of greater cardinality or something, but it's it seems like, I guess I put it this way, it doesn't seem like this relationship can be, um, can be the same as the relationship that's supposed to sort of identify the modes of all the different attributes with each other. Okay, there's been a question for yeah. Uh, this, is, this is like a basic point. Yeah. It's like when, when you talk about idea in this sense and like the, the attribute of thought, is it, is it enough, is it adequate enough for us just to think of like the way that we have ideas and to think of that as how that applies to all the other uh, ideas that we're talking about right now. Yeah, I mean, like, but okay, so like the ideas we have are ideas that God has. Remember, everything is in God. <laughs> so um, uh, it's going to turn out that, it, like, sometimes an idea that um, is. Um, clear and distinct, to use Descartes' terminology, and Spinoza also sometimes uses this, an idea that's clear and distinct when considered as part of the divine intellect, when considered as part of a finite intellect is obscure and confused, even though it's the exact same idea, right? And the reason is because as Spinoza puts it, it's like, it's, it's like having the conclusion without the premises. <laughs> Right, like I, my mind contains this idea, but it doesn't contain all the infinitely many ideas in the divine intellect that have this idea as their consequence. So that's what, right. But yeah, so it is, these base, these are ideas and it's basically Descartes term idea, right? So, it, I mean, sometimes Spinoza even talks about the formal versus objective reality of these things. Um, it's basically the same. Uh, term. Does, does that answer it, or do you still have another question? Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Max, and then. Uh, so, 
uh, for this axiom when we're talking about no, like, are we talking about um, are we talking about like uh, like entire knowledge of an idea or just like any knowledge at all of an idea, including like recognizing that something exists at all? Well, yeah, that was that was the thing I was trying to dodge by. <laughs> Um, but so like, I mean, what it really means is that it's <laughs> the thing that I just erased. You can't really understand what the effect is unless you understand how it follows from its cause. Um, so Like, okay, so remember, I'm doing this kind of backwards from the way I imagined doing it, but maybe maybe it's better to do it the way, in the order of questions rather than my own order. Um, that, um, remember, Descartes had a problem saying how bodies can be different from each other. So, like if you um if so if you think as Spinoza and Descartes both do, if you're if you're a mechanist and you think that the properties of bodies are extension and the modes of extension. So like basically all a body does is take up space. It doesn't have any other special because like of course if you thought bodies had something else beyond that right like color or something then it would be easy to understand how these two could be different because they're different colors but we don't have that all we have is that they take up space now i mean on the one hand like you can understand or at least all these people think you can understand um like Hume is going to do a big takedown of that, but like I'm not sure which one is right. But anyway, all these people think you can understand how one body can cause something in another body because this one takes up space and this one takes up space. So if this one moves, this one is going to have to move out of the way. <laughs> so bodies can act on each other by pushing, right? That. That basically is why this view is called mechanism. It's like, you know, that the world works the way a machine works. Things push each other. So, um, but on the other hand, it's hard to make sense of this whole picture in Descartes because when you ask, wait, this one won't allow this one into its space. But there's nothing different about the space that this one is filling than there, from the what space that this one is filling. What does this line mean? <laughs> right? Like all there is on either side of that line is extension. And I mean, what Descartes himself says is, well, they're moving differently, but that doesn't seem very satisfactory, right? Because what's moving? Right? Like moving, this is part of Hume's argument, and you know, like moving um, presupposes something that would you know where what it is when it's in this particular place before you know whether it's moving or not, right? So, um, I mean, I guess like, no, I shouldn't get that. All right, but anyway, so, so you might say, well, this body, what makes this body different from the other bodies is that this body got to where it is by being like pushed into this place by these, these other bodies. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, first of all, Descartes can't say that. Why can't Descartes say that? Because Descartes thinks a body is a substance. And if it's a substance, it can be conceived by itself. 
right? That's the definition of substance that Descartes and Spinoza agree on. It, it exists in itself and can be conceived through itself. So that is, I have to be able to know what this body is without knowing anything about any other body. I mean, so like, Descartes will agree with Spinoza that I can't conceive of this body without God. But that doesn't, that doesn't help here, right? Not given what Descartes thinks the relationship between God and finite things is. So yeah, I mean, it's true. I can't conceive of this body without God, but I can't conceive of any body or anything without God. That's, that doesn't help me say which this one is. What I want is to say, I can't conceive of what this one is without including the ideas of its causes. So that means it's not a substance, right? So, so Spinoza, so first of all, Spinoza is using that to solve that problem. Now you might say, well, how does that solve the problem? What are these bodies? And the answer is, well, I can't know what they are without knowing about their causes or conditions, I mean, like how to separate out the time and the space order here I, is another thing that I'm not sure exactly how Spinoza intends to do it or whether he has it worked out. But right, like there's certain conditions that are necessary for this body to exist, both in terms of like the surfaces that are around it and in terms of the causes that put it there and made it move and whatever. And if you wanna know what those are, then you have to know about their causes. And you might think, well, how is this going to work? Isn't it an infinite regress? And the answer is, yes, it's an infinite regress. An infinite intellect <laughs> can understand exactly what this body is. But a finite intellect never can. Its idea of it is always confused and obscure. Um, I'm not sure who to call next. Did you have just a follow up on this? I was just thinking, uh, if if you would say that like something existing at all is an effect, then I feel like you could say then God is the cause, and since we can never truly like understand God, then supposedly by this logic we could never really um, have knowledge of anything. Well, we can't have perfect knowledge. Yeah, we can't okay, have perfectly so clear and distinct. I, I, I just want to put that to my main first question that, that I just wanted to make sure. We we can't have so like what no, we, we can have knowledge at all of anything, like even if it's not full knowledge, just limited knowledge. Well, yeah, I mean again, but maybe this is better to put off until next time when we see what he says about the different types of knowledge and whatever. But um but yeah, basically, you know, we can't have perfectly clear and distinct knowledge of any finite mode because every finite mode. So this is proposition um, 20. Um, oh, part one. Um, Proposition 28 of part one says, every individual thing, that is anything whatever which is finite and has a determinate existence cannot exist or be determined to act unless it be determined to exist and to act by another cause, which is also finite and has a determinate existence. And this cause again cannot exist or be determined to act unless it be determined to exist and to act by another cause, which is also finite and has a determinate existence, and so on ad infinitum. So, um, and if you look at the beginning of the proof, whatever is determined to exist and to act has been so determined by God, but that which is finite and has a determinate existence cannot have been produced by the absolute nature of one of God's attributes. For whatever follows from the absolute nature of one of God's attributes is infinite and eternal. So, right, like what he's, um, 
he's referring back to prop to the, there's a series of propositions 21 22 23 i think where he shows that um anything that follows directly from the from the nature of god is infinite and eternal and anything that follows from the nature of one of those things as modified by an infinite and eternal attribute is itself infinite and eternal and no matter how far you go you're still going to get to things that are infinite and eternal so how does god have consequences that are finite and not eternal and the answer is um no matter how many no matter how many finite steps you take from the divine essence you still get to something infinite and eternal to get to something finite you need to take an infinite number of steps <laughs> yeah Well, so again, let me see. I think I wrote down somewhere where he says this. I think it was in today's reading. Scrollium to part two, proposition 13 on page 72. Um, from the above we understand not only that the human mind is united to the body but also what is to be understood by the union of mind and body um, but nobody can understand this union adequately or distinctly unless he first gains adequate knowledge of the nature of our body for what we have so far demonstrated is of quite general application and applies to men no more than to other individuals, which are all animate, albeit in different degrees. For there is necessarily in God an idea of each thing whatever, of which idea God is the cause in the same way as he is the cause of the idea of the human body. And so whatever we have asserted of the idea of the human body must necessarily be asserted of the idea of each thing. Right? So he's saying that every thing has a mind. They are all animate, albeit in different degrees. So if a rock is a thing, and again, I was... So, like, you know, Leibniz is going to agree that everything has a mind, or that every body has a mind, but he's going to say that um, a rock is not one body. A rock is like if you want to find the bodies that have mind inside the rock you have to take it apart into very small pieces and when you get small enough eventually you'll see that it's made out of little creatures and that the space between them what geography. no it's not ge no it's not geology i mean it's more it's fantastic geology right i mean the idea is that just as like when you take uh, something that looks like a homogeneous drop of water and you, you magnify it by a lot. Eventually you see little things swimming in it. And then, but of course you still see empty space between them. But then Leibniz says, but if you magnified it even more, you would, see, you would start to see the even tinier things that are swimming in that space. And then if you magnified it even more, you would start to see the even tinier things, right? But, um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that the whole drop of water is a living thing. 
It's just that everywhere in it is some living thing, right? Like bigger or smaller. So um, like if Spinoza thinks something like that, then he would say, well, the, the rock doesn't have a mind, but every every actual like organized body within the rock has a mind. But I tend to think partly because Spinoza doesn't say anything about that, but also partly because it doesn't seem to be in the spirit of Spinoza. I, I feel like Spinoza probably wants to go the other way and say, like, whatever you take to be one body, you can correspondingly take something in the attribute of thought to be its mind. So yes, the rock has a mind, and, you know, but also like the left half of the rock has a mind. Possibly it doesn't even have to be contiguous. Um, and it also doesn't have to be, when you talk about compound bodies, like the co he defines a compound body. This is what I said I wasn't going to talk about, but maybe I will talk about it. <laughs> but he defines a compound body in a very abstract way. He doesn't divide it, define it as a bunch of bodies stuck together. And that's important, right? Because like take the human body, it's, it's not always the same stuff. Right, like we eat and we breathe in and breathe out and poop and like all that stuff, right? And like our, so like what small bodies this compound body is made out of changes. So, so instead Spinoza defines a compound body as a kind of constant of motion of other bodies. <laughs> um, and um, the compound body like remains as long as that constant of motion is conserved, but the the bodies that make it up could could be could change, and they can change their position and 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 motion and rest because like as long as you still you know so like everything can change about it as long as it keeps that one thing constant whatever it is. So that potentially means that the, a body could be composed of like tiny little parts spread all over the place. <laughs> all right, I'm so, it's like a lot of hands up, but first of all, I wanted to make sure that there were people I didn't get to a, a long time ago. You don't still have a question? Do you still have a question? Oh, yeah. I mean, my question is kind of changing from like, <laughs> yeah. but like, uh, with regard to the count, like compound bodies, so did you not want to talk about them? Like, you know, just, like, <laughs> <laughs> I already did it, so yeah, I might as well ask about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, all the uh, like the organisms that are say, like, or I guess all the bodies that compose like the human body, for example, that they are like different from each other. They're like the same stuff. They're like distinct. And, well, remember that. So, like, they can't be. They can't be made out of different stuff. So, yeah, but I mean, they can have different composition. Now, I mean, of course, that like that doesn't like Descartes can't use that to solve the problem, right? Because, it, uh, like, if if Descartes says, well, this body is different from this one because. This body is made of little triangular parts, and this one is made of little spherical parts, or whatever. Like that's not going to work because I'm still going to ask, wait, what makes this a triangle? What does this line mean, right? But but assuming you can solve that problem, then yeah, you can explain why um, it certainly seems like a human body is made out of different types of stuff. And and Spinoza says that it has liquid parts and solid parts and hard parts and soft parts. And, Right. Yeah. So um, I guess what I was kind of curious about is like of these various bodies, the way we like the way we kind of make distinctions between them, would it be based on their like relational affection or like uh, I'm forgetting the like term to use for attributes, yeah, thank you. Attribute. A attribute, unlike in Descartes, Spinoza defines attribute in a way that makes it clear that an attribute is an attribute of a substance. I don't think he ever uses attribute in this context. Okay. But he uses, sometimes he says properties. Um, uh, sometimes he talks about 
um, makes a distinction between existence and act. So, right, like the same body can exist but have different states of motion. That is, and acts. Um, it's a little bit weird. Again, it's hard to understand exactly how this is supposed to line up with the. I mean, is there something that ideas have that's like motion or rest? Or is it rather that, that ideas, there's an idea of the thing and then there's an idea of its act. <laughs> and those are, yeah. Well, there's a difference between having an idea of something and acting because of that thing. I have an idea of the bicycle, even though I'm not thinking about bicycles. So maybe that's like the difference between being and acting. I, 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 really thought I see what you're really saying. Like, yeah, I don't know what Spinoza says about. So. Um, it says that, it, um, that one scrolling or whatever is in book, in book one where he talks about the, the essence of the triangle and he's talking about God and he brings up God in Proposition 11. And he says that the, like, the essence of the triangle is, is determined in some way, but whether or not it exists is follows from the order of, of causes, literally. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so just the general question. Of, so, like, if you were saying that sometimes I have the idea of a bicycle and sometimes I don't, then, then the answer to that would be in terms of what, it, what time means and why we say that. I, but I think you weren't saying that, right? You were, you were saying, I have the idea of a bicycle the whole time, but sometimes it's like um, I'm using it and sometimes I'm not. Um, I'm and, not currently thinking of something but I know what it is. If it suddenly appeared before me, I would recognize it. And I would recognize that the idea I have of it now is contiguous with the one I have that I know what it is. Yeah. So I had the idea the whole time, even when I wasn't doing it deliberately. So, um... Yeah, okay, maybe I should, I mean, since I didn't start at the beginning of my lecture, maybe I should go back and say something more general about how God causes the world to exist, according to Spinoza, because that's what the end of part one is about. Most of what we've been talking about has been about the beginning of part two, which is also important. But I mean, I did read that one thing, Proposition 27 of part one, about how God causes finite things to exist. God causes finite things to exist insofar as one of his attributes is affected by some other finite mode. And he caused that finite mode to exist insofar as that attribute was affected by some other finite mode and so on and ad infinite. Right? So, um, but just like more generally, so like, okay. So in one sense, the question of how does God cause the world to exist is is like really simple, according to Spinoza, because the world is God. God causes the world to exist the same way God causes God to exist. <laughs> Self-caused, right? Um, so, um, um, But like, I mean, of course it turns out to be more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. Is it not finite things uh, that originate from God? 
Well, it, it depends what you mean by thing, right? There are finite modes. <laughs> they aren't, there are no finite substances. Um, and, you know, I was just talking about why that's not just a verbal issue, right? The, the fact that bodies are not substances, according to Spinoza, and are substances, according to Descartes, like, even though Spinoza's physics is really the same as Descartes' physics, um, the, the metaphysics behind it is totally, is not, maybe not totally different, but is quite different in such a way that Spinoza can say something about well, what this body is that Descartes can't say. Because Descartes says it's a finite substance and Spinoza says it's a finite mode of an infinite substance. But yeah, so there are finite things that come from God, but they are, they, they, can't exist or be conceived except as in God. So is um is mode similar to like form thing? Mode is similar to accident, as I said before, right? Substance. Roughly speaking. And this holds for, these two hold for, well, I mean, I guess all three, but this one is just substance again. <laughs> all of these hold for Descartes too, except that Descartes, you have to stick in principle here. Right, the principle attribute corresponds to differentia and, oh wait, I switched my mode corresponds to accident. So it's like finite things are the relationship of a finite thing to God is like what we thought was the relationship of the whiteness in Socrates to Socrates. It can't exist on its own. It can only exist in Socrates. And it can't even be conceived, uh, the, the part where it can't even be conceived without the concept of Socrates is the Cartesian part, right? Where the, or that is the rationalist part where we say, things can't just have any old accidents. The accidents have to be modes of their, their primary attribute. So those modes, accidents of God, in that they're in God but not as in God, is an attribute of God a part like or or is it another kind of quality well um, it's written be written answer no uh, it's no I haven't written the answer I was just fixing the e but uh but the attribute um but I'm going to say the answer I have said the answer before so the answer is that Spinoza and the way Spinoza and Descartes both disagree with the Aristotelians is the Aristotelians think that the differentiae are parts of the essence of the thing. Right? So like the essence of Socrates is made up of rational and then like whatever the differentia of animal is, right? Like, you know, moving and sensing and then like whatever the differentiate of living thing is right like you have to add up all these differentiate and you get that then you get the essence of socrates right if you want to know what kind of thing socrates is so like if you know if you're an aristotelian and someone asked you what kind of thing is socrates you're going to say well socrates is a rational animal genus differentiate, right? But then if they ask you, oh, what's an animal? You're going to give genus di differentiate again. An animal is a living thing that has the power of moving and sensing or something like that, right? And then they ask, oh, what's a living thing? You're going to give genus and differentiate again until you get to the highest genus substance where you, you can't give a definition. Um, although you can give a description of it as Aristotle does in the categories. 
So, um, so all these differentiate are parts of Socrates' essence, whereas um, uh, Descartes says a substance can only have one primary attribute that expresses its entire essence. Yeah. So, like following this, right, like the essence either being a composite of all the differentiated of the genuses um, or like the essence just being one quality, um, then what is like, if, if God is the highest and only substance, what is God's essence? If you don't have a, like you can't make a genus that incorporates God because God is the only thing there's that's how can you make a genus around one substance well i mean so i mean there's a reason why well maybe i shouldn't say that say it <laughs> no i was gonna say is a reason why we're why why we're we've abandoned the term differentia and going over to attribute but actually it's that's it's not really i mean because it's Descartes who makes that move. Um, so, maybe that, therefore, I shouldn't have said that. But, but, but what I want to say is, yeah. So, um, these attributes. For, so, let, so actually, let me just finish out the picture here, right? So, Aristotelian, the essence is like divided up into many attributes or differentiate, right? Like there's this one, this one, this one, this one. And when you put them all together, you get the essence. Descartes says, there's just one and it is the essence. Spinoza says, there's infinitely many of them but each one of them expresses the entire essence. They're not parts of the essence. Right? So he's so in a sense, he's still closer to Descartes than he is to the Aristotelians, even though he's going back to saying that there are many, that the same substance can have many attributes. They're, the, the different attributes are not parts of the essence. I don't know how to draw this, but. <laughs> anyway, well, what I'm seeing in like part one, top 20, God's essence would be his, uh, God's existence. God's essence and existence are one and the same. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a traditional thing to say about God, that in God, essence and existence are not different. Um, that's basically the ontological theory, right? That the essence of the thing is how you conceive of it, and the ontological argument is that you can't conceive of God without um, conceiving to exist. So his being is part of his essence. Yeah. See, that's uh, that makes it sound like his existence is implied by his essence, or is part of his essence, or something like that. But you want to say that his existence is his essence. That is, there's no distinction between existence and essence in God. Um, I, um, uh, I mean, yeah, if you read the proof. Each one of his attributes expresses existence. Therefore, the same attributes of God that explicate his eternal essence at the same time explicate his eternal existence. I mean, so to get from what you were saying to the traditional version of this, you have to add something about, um, I think, you have to add something about the simplicity of the divine essence. 
right? Like remember, Descartes said that, but but Descartes isn't inventing this. Descartes said that um, that that um, one of the most important features of infinite perfection is its complete simplicity, right? The inseparability of all the infinite perfections, that they're all really the same thing. Um, so existence isn't just part of his essence because uh, his essence doesn't really have parts, <laughs> right? So like, I mean, Descartes will agree with that in the case of God and Aristotelians also, Right, so like, uh, you know, like Thomas Aquinas says that there are genera and species of angels, and there are genera and species of celestial bodies, and there are genera and species of sublunar bodies, but God has no genus, right? God is, doesn't belong to a genus. Um, um, yeah, I don't remember how I got. <laughs> it was Did someone else become a host somehow? Hang on. All right. Anyway, um, the internet is definitely weird. Um, the uh, what was I saying? What was I talking about? I don't remember. Oh, for top four, we still think there are other things. Well, we still think there are other things, and we're still thinking that two things might differ from each other because of the difference in attributes. But of course, it turns out that no, that can't happen because there's only one substance, and it has all attributes. So they're not they they correspond to differentia in the sense that they express the essence, not but not in the sense that they differentiate in the sense that they differentiate. Yeah. Um, when you were like drawing those little like diagrams there, uh, yeah, about what you were between Descartes and Hegel there, was that with regard to essence, right? Or yeah, this circle was supposed to mean the essence. Yeah. And its division into parts was supposed to be division into differentiate. And it, the the scheme didn't work out very well. Because when I got to Descartes, it was just a circle. And then when I got to Spinoza, I didn't know what to, how to draw it. So, okay. so um, <laughs> is there like a way you could like describe the difference between like essence, body, and substance? Like maybe just with regards to Spinoza, because I'm like between essence, bodies, and substance. Well. Okay, let me let, let me just say a couple more general things about God's production of, of other right. So um and, and then hopefully these other things will um so um so so I'm not, I'm not sure what to um So there's like a hierarchy here. First of all, there's, there's the divine essence. Now, I mean, okay, so everything has an essence. Like every finite thing also has an essence. Um, it's uh, the essence of a finite thing does not involve its existence. <laughs> um, but um, but here I'm talking. I mean the divine essence. And at some point, Spinoza says the divine essence is the same as, as the divine power. Right? What? So the divine essence is like, um, um, 
what an intellect would be understanding if it when it what an intellect is understanding when it understands what God is. Um, an intellect understands what God is by understanding one of the attributes, right? So the definition of attribute was. By attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives of substance as constituting its essence. Um, so, um, right, and because the essence is what you would be understanding when you understand what God is, like when you understand, if you understand what God is, you understand all the infinite consequences that follow from that. So what you're understanding is the power to produce all those infinite consequences. <laughs> so that's right. That's why he says the divine essence is the is God's power. The essence, God's essence is power. Um, infinite power. Um, and then on the next line we have attributes. And then on the next line we have infinite modes of attributes. And then finally, we have finite modes. So like this kind of roughly corresponds to a traditional picture of a hierarchy of like modes of being or something like that, right? We have the divine essence, we have the divine attributes, although that part is controversial. It seems like allowing there to be divine attributes might undermine divine unity and simplicity. <laughs> um, and but then, and then we have some kind of like um, necessary and eternal beings, like angels or celestial bodies or whatever. And then we have like finite things that come and go, <laughs> and like sublunar bodies. Um, so it's kind of like that, only, of course, uh, so like the relationship between these different levels in a traditional picture would be that the higher level contains eminently the perfections that are going to be found in the lower level. But as I keep emphasizing, Spinoza has gotten rid of that eminent being thing. I mean, that may be partly what makes the idea object relation suddenly become a, a bigger problem than it was before. Because remember, the idea object relation it is kind of like the relation between eminent being and, and its image. <laughs> that is, the object is kind of like the object contains at a higher level of reality what the idea contains at a lower level of reality. Um, so like in Descartes, that's part of a, like, it, or Thomas Aquinas or whatever, that's part of a, that's what my younger daughter sounded like. She was a baby. She was 11 now, so she doesn't sound like anything. Anyway, um, um, all right, anyway, that's just an aside. So like, um, uh, so in Spinoza, this relationship is what, quote unquote, efficient causation, which is just regular causation, right? Like it's the way one co body causes another body to move by pushing it. That's efficient causation. That's what's going on between these levels. What does that mean? Well, given axiom four of part one, what that means is that... Um, uh, there's like a logical progression. Um, if like if you try to understand what one of these finite modes is, well, first of all, you're going to have to understand infinitely many other finite modes. But moreover, you're going to have to under you're going to have to understand. Um, 
Do you know what the infinite modes of extension are? But you're gonna have to understand the attribute of extension, right? Like that is to know what this body is, you have to know what makes it different from the other bodies. And that's gonna be an infinitely long story. But you're also gonna have to know what it has in common with all the other bodies and that's extension. Oh, so right, each one of these levels, the, the, the sense of logical progression here is um, at least as we've seen it so far, the sense of logical progression is um, you can't have the idea of this without having the idea of that. Although you can have the idea of this without having the idea of that. So the infinite power of God is the um, like um, infinite, yeah, all right, no, I'm still not, okay, no, I have to add this other thing first. So, so you might think, um, okay, that logical progression is about definition, right? Like, I can't know what a certain body is unless I know what the attribute of extension is. I guess the infinite and internal modes of extension are actually like um, geometrical shapes. I'm not sure that's right. Mm -hmm. All right, anyway, it's, um, so, um, so fine, I can't understand what it is without understanding what this is, but, <laughs> What does that have to do with this actually making this? So again, axiom four of part one says that somehow those are the same relationship. That is, when when you know how that something can only be understood, when you know that B can only be understood in terms of A, you're knowing that, um, uh, if you judge that A exists, you must judge that B exists. Um, so in other words, you don't just get an infinite like hierarchy of ideas that are defined in terms of each other. You also get an infinite series of ideas that you have to assent to if you ascend assent to the prior ones. So in other words, um, it's both like the logical progression is both progression of definition in one direction, but in the other direction it's a it's a it's a progression of proof. Um, if like B can be defined, can only be defined in terms of A, or, and somehow this is the same relationship, if I judge that A exists, that's part of a proof that B exists. That's like the last step in the proof before the conclusion that B exists. <laughs> so, um, so that's why being the like the the one thing that like everything adds up to um, adds up to. The one thing that's involved in understanding everything is also the thing that causes everything to exist. And 
it causes everything to exist, which can only be understood in terms of it, that it makes everything possible. So um, everything that possibly could exist, exists. Everything conceivable exists. If it's conceivable, then it's conceivable in terms of the divine essence. Because if it's conceivable, then, I mean, that was what Proposition 15 of Part 1 said. Everything... Um, Whatever is, is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. <laughs> right? So, um, um, if it's conceivable, it can't be conceived without God. If it can't be conceived without God, by axiom four of part one, it's an effect of God. So, everything conceivable is an effect of God. So, God causes everything conceivable to exist. Okay, so, like, in a sense, this is a great conclusion. Why? Because, like, one of the, the biggest problems about understanding how God can cause the world is what would cause God, what would make God want to cause one thing rather than another? Right? Like, what would determine the divine will as, as, as one way of Kind of Kantian way of putting this. What what determines the divine will? What gives it a specific aim? Um, and you know, Spinoza discusses in that uh, appendix to part one two traditional answers to that. One is um, it's just by uh, an absolute arbitrary decision. There's no reason. That's kind of weird. And the other is um, God creates the best thing, or at least a good thing. That's kind of weird because it makes it sound like there's some standard outside of God that, that God is referring to when deciding what to make. So Spinoza, how do we answer the, the question, how does God decide what to make? God doesn't decide what to make. God makes everything conceivable. <laughs> but now we run into a problem because, and this is, I'm getting back to this by this long route, but I think it was the only route back to it. We end up with a problem because not everything exists at the same time, right? Like Bucephalus doesn't exist now. Bucephalus existed a long time ago. Um, so, um, or like, to put it differently, like, how can this logical relation be the same as this relation, which is, which is a temporal relation? A comes before B and causes it to exist. So Spinoza's going to say, but this is, um, in some ways, causes more problems than it solves, right? But... These are the two phrases he uses, subspecie temporis and subspecie aeternitatis. Under the, so species here means like uh, appearance or like respect, like, 
aspect, I guess, is the probably the right way to is, is, is probably like a word that might give the best idea under the aspect of time or under the aspect of eternity. So the, that is, he's going to say that under the aspect of eternity, God eternally causes all things to exist. And that's the way it looks, so to speak, from God's point of view. Right? Like, everything follows either in a finite number of steps or when we get down here in an infinite number of steps from the divine essence. So, and the divine essence is eternal. So everything eternally follows from the divine essence, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, and the question is, how, do, how is this possible? Somehow, from our point of view, this that eternal logical relationship gets like unfolded into a temporal relationship. So like Bucephalus doesn't exist until. So like Suspusiae Tanitatis would say Bucephalus exists as a consequence of exactly these other modes. <clears throat> and remember, we just think of Bucephalus as a mind or a body, but let's think of him as a body for the time being. So if you think of Bucephalus as a body, you know, Bucephalus exists as a consequence of the existence of these other bodies eternally, right? But somehow from our point of view, that turns into Bucephalus doesn't come to exist until those other bodies come to exist. Like Bucephalus' parents or whatever. <laughs> um, so, um, and somehow the same thing happens with the ideas. That's right, that's the weird part, right? Because here you might think, well, this is definitely, this is a logical progression. One idea is defined in terms of the other when you look at ideas as, as like concepts, or if you look at ideas as judgments, where the idea involves judging that, that its object exists, then this idea like follows from this one. This is a step in a proof. This is the premise and this is the conclusion. But those aren't temporal relationships. And yet somehow the fact that like my mind doesn't exist until my body exists and also stops existing when my body stops existing. <laughs> Notice that implication, right? Um, is uh, um, is the way that logical relationship looks to me. So it's I can I can this and what's the other one? Temporis. Temporis. Right. These are these are genitive of right. It's tempus temporis. Itenitas, itenitatis. So this means like of time, of eternity. Um, were you going to say something or were you just asking how to? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, so this is like, this is weird, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, so so ex existing is not the same as currently being alive. So like Bucephalus exists even though he is dead. Well, it's like there's two different ways to think about it. That is because Spinoza has to account for both somehow, uh -huh. right? Like it's both the case that Bucephalus has to exist because Bucephalus is one of the infinitely many conceivable things. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, he obviously has to explain why somehow from our point of view, it looks like some things exist and then other things exist, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, if I say like, well, there's complications here because I'm, 
suppose I say, well, a, a unicorn is conceivable. Does that mean a unicorn exists? I mean, it's complicated because I don't have a clear and distinct idea of a unicorn. All I, I'm imagining a unicorn, right? And so I don't know what the object of that, that idea really is. Only God knows that. But, 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 but just say, you know, Say I didn't want to get into that, and you said, wait, a unicorn exists? It's conceivable, but I thought there aren't any unicorns, right? So, so Spinoza can say, oh, it has to exist somewhere at some time, in some context. It might be really, really far away from here. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yeah. who's first. Okay, you're first. Um, so the question I have is the thing about there is like kind of like more on that is just like what is like existing in that sense then? Because like is it not like the unicorn exists but the idea of exists? Is, is that in itself a different type of existence? Like um, like if I'm living and then I die, like I existed but now the idea of me is existing after my passing. Is that two different forms of existing or is it the same existence? Uh, I think, yeah, I see what you're asking. And I guess the way I'm understanding it is not, I probably could have framed it better, but like yeah, what defines, yeah, like, what defines existence? Yeah, you're like an objective existence. Well, oh, okay. So, uh, right. Maybe, maybe I'm I'm overthinking it. Like, I mean, but it being an extension, being in thought, are two modes or two aspects of thought, right? And so, yeah. for any given one, it corresponds as they would be the other. Right. That's the relation of the mind and body. So, presumably, the same relation exists between. God's idea of the unicorn and the actual unicorn that's out there somewhere on some planet in the universe. Yeah, but the question is, what about my idea of a unicorn? This is that this is the thing I was dodging before when I think when it, you know, like I don't have a clear and distinct idea of a unicorn. Um, if I had a clear and distinct, well. If I had a clear and distinct idea of a unicorn, I would know that a unicorn exists now, according to Spinoza. Um, um, but, uh, um, I don't have a clear and distinct idea of any finite thing. So I don't know for sure what exists now, except there's like one exception, namely that I know that my own body exists now, even though I don't have a clear and distinct idea of that either. <laughs> I do know that it exists. I mean, that this will be in the reading for next time. Um, so, yeah. So God is the only one who can conceive anything because he's the only one who can know the infinite, um, have the infinite intellect to understand the causes of effects. Right. I mean, so God doesn't exactly have an intellect. This is another. Well, he because, has a whatever. Like well, no, because whatever. because the infinite intellect is an infinite mode of the attribute of thought. Gotcha. Right. So uh, what God has is thought. <laughs> but one of the consequences of that is intellect. Right. So and it's only the, in, the uh, only the infinite intellect knows finite things clearly and distinctly. But infinite things can be known clearly and distinctly by a finite. Okay. Because there's only a finite number of steps from the divine essence. <laughs> and um, as Spinoza is going to prove later, every mind, I mean, that is, he doesn't exactly put it this way, but if we look at how his proof works, this is what he's proving. Every mind, no matter how simple, has to have an adequate idea of the divine essence. 
<laughs> but, but but that's why when I say unicorns exist, unicorns may not be the, the way I imagine them to be. They they presumably are not, right? That is not only don't because my idea of them is not clear and distinct. I don't know whether they exist now, and I also don't know exactly what they are. Not right. Or the infinite intellect does, which I guess is the same as I mean, it's as close as you can get to God knowing. Yeah. So uh, I feel like it's kind of resetting like ground to try to tell you how I think it's like it's kind of hard to understand for this. So okay. um I'm quickly really though, because we're out like, of time. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah, but uh, anyways, like like I know that we're defining like absolute as like differentiating like meaning of accident, like those are like semantical in some way, I guess. But like what are what is like the attribute that is like defined by like like divine essence? Like what what is our like the definition of what like absolute is? Is it respect to that and like an infinite mode with respect to like absolute that if I have mode with respect to like infinite mode? Well, again, the definition of attribute is definition four in part one. By attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives of substance or of a substance as constituting its essence. So again, like at the beginning of part one, we think there might be lots of substances <laughs> and lots of intellects that can that conceive different attributes as, as constituting the essence of different substances. But uh, by the time we get to Proposition 14, we realize there's only one substance, there's one infinite intellect that perceives an infinite number of attributes as constituting the essence of that one substance. <laughs> but as for infinite modes, I don't think I have time to try to explain that, but maybe I'll talk about it again next time. Um, okay, we're out of time.